Hello everyone, this is John from RPGs and More, and in tonight's video, I'd like to talk about what happens when the adventuring location is the same place as your safe spot, say your town, if you will. And what do I mean by this? Well, one of the most common pieces of advice that a, a new dungeon master or game master receives. You need to have a town or a home base for your your party. This is some place that they can go to restock supplies, to sell their uh, sell and or store their treasure, uh, to meet non-player characters, maybe recruit hirelings and henchmen, uh, or to get side quests or main quests or quests in general. And it's generally considered that it's going to be a safe location. You're not too worried about it. A lot of times uh, people won't even narrate what happens in town because it's town. You just ask when the rule books come out and we say, well, okay, we sell this for this much, and we sell this for that much, and we buy this, this, that, and the other thing. And the DM says, well, yeah, there's only... There's only three of those in the store, so you can get three right now. Um, oh, how do you know that, GM? Well, I rolled on this handy-dandy chart that I have, and it tells me that there's only three. The chart is a blank piece of paper behind the DM screen. They just rolled a die and said, oh, there's only three. Um, you can use that trick. I don't, don't use it too often. Uh, if you're going to start really limiting what's in shops, I recommend actually making a chart so you can keep track of it so you don't accidentally... Um, give yourself a harder time than necessary. <laughs> so anyway, but that's that's where you start. And then the next thing you need is a place for the players to go adventuring, for their, their characters to um, explore. And that is most commonly a dungeon, hence Dungeons and Dragons. Um, that's where a lot of this started. But really, it is an exploration location. If you're doing a hex crawl, then the place to look to adventure is all the hexes directly around your starting village or town or fort. And you just kind of keep going. And as you explore out, then more adventure location is unveiled and you get to go to more places. Kind of neat like that. Okay, so we've got those two things. And that's really all you need. You don't need a big, long backstory of why this was here. Why, why was this dungeon here? Why was this, uh, this village here? Why was this town here? What is here? You know, is this a nation? Is it a country? Is it a, um, a duchy? Like a grand duchy? Like a grand duchy from Karamekos? Hmm? Um, all right, anyway. So... You don't really have to have all of those answers. It, it's kind of fun if you have a cool name, such as when they use the Grand Duchy of Karamekos. That's a grand name. Even if you know nothing else about it, you know that it is a it is grand, it's duchy, and the guy in charge is named Karamekos. Okay. Um, and the DM can fill in whatever information they feel is, in, is important from there. Maybe they're really deep into the lower of Karamekos and they want to really get into what it means to live in this place. And so like, you know, they, everyone gets a 10-page a leaflet that um, explains the backstory of this adventure location. And so you got to like, you know, decide how does my character fit into this. You can do all that. You don't need to. All you really need to say is this is where you're from. It's mostly human location and it's very futile. Um, go for it. Elves and doors exist. They're rare. If you're like, cool, uh, I want to play, you know, a reanimated zombie. Well, probably not going to be able to play a reanimated zombie unless the DM's like, cool, let's figure out how that would work. Uh, could be an interesting challenge. I'm not sure I'd be up for that challenge, but some GMs might. It depends on on the flavor of campaign. If I want to, if I'm running a serious campaign, no. If I'm running a a silly campaign or a Gonzo campaign or one of those kind of cam or like a Star Wars Cantina campaign, 
uh, where I want there to be a massive variety of peoples and places and things in this place, then it'd be like, you want to place a reanimated zombie? All right, what type? <laughs> let's figure this out. Um, anyway, so let's, but, but we're talking about what happens when the adventure location and the dungeon are the same place. Because we just skipped a step, in a sense, when we do that. Uh, we don't have, there's no need for an outdoor encounter to travel to the dungeon. The dungeon is right there outside your door. Oh dear, Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> um, what are some examples of this kind of thing? Well, that's a, a good question, and I'm glad that you asked, or I asked in your stead. Uh, the, some best, the best examples that I can think of this are when the players are among a group of people that have been trapped in the dungeon. Maybe this has been going on for a long time. Maybe uh, the nation's idea of dealing with criminals is to throw them all into this giant dungeon complex underground and see who survives. Um, that's, by the way, the basic idea of the plot behind the uh, Spiderweb Software game's Exile, this Exile series. I'll later renamed the Avernum series, and I find I, that was one of my introductions to role-playing games on the computer, and I quite enjoy them, uh, or did. I haven't played them in like 10 years, but I did enjoy them at the time. So, the that's one idea. Everyone's thrown into a giant labyrinth underground, and you've got to survive. And within that labyrinth, People may have carved out their own little niches. You may actually find a city that has been carved out of the halls of this labyrinth. Where someone's like knocked down some walls in order to create larger rooms. And they kind of like, they found a water source. They found a way to deal with waste. Excuse me. They found a way to grow food, probably fungus. You know. They found a way to provide light, and, and they're, they're working on security, and they're probably trying to turn it into a, a safer place for the, the weaker prisoners that have been thrown into there, who are probably, you know, some of them might be smarter. They're just not as physically capable, and so they need a, a place to hang out where they can then do their crafting thing, while the more physically intimidating uh, adventurers go out and find the resources and the materials and bring it back. And it can turn into, like, it can be like a small little, like, five-person community, or it can be a 30-person uh, Thorpe, or you can even get up to a couple hundred people in this village that has been carved out of, out of this, these, the corridors of this labyrinth. Um, another idea of this is, it's a city. The city itself is the dungeon, in a sense, because the city itself is the adventure location. That means there is no safe town to go to. There are shops and stores and there are uh, you know inns and homes that you can visit. And there's back alleys that you can go get stabbed in. There's a lot of, a lot of things going on. And this is actually, uh, like for example, if you're using OD&D, this is very doable because you, you've got in those wandering monster tables some very, a very nice table that tells you what you're going to encounter in a city, assuming that your city, you know, merges with what is, uh, what is assumed in that setting. We're about to have a cat break. Either that or the cat's about to break something. Anyway. Could you not? He wants to play. So, what's another idea? Well, a forest. Same concept as the dungeon, but... It's in a forest instead, a deep, dark thing like, you know, I think they refer to it as the, the Black Forest from ancient France. Uh, not ancient France, but medi you know, early medieval France. And, um, or, you know, a place that seems very dark ages in tone. And it's a deep, dark wood or a swamp or a moor. Uh, it's a very contained location. You're not going to go out of it because there's nothing out of it to go to that the characters are interested in. That's the point. Maybe they're trapped there by a curse. 
Maybe they simply don't want to go anywhere else because this is where their family's at. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why they might want to, not want to leave this location. Maybe they're, uh, maybe the dungeon is a, a location out of time and mind or in time and mind. The location could be something uh, that is generated within the head of one of the player characters and everyone's trapped inside of it. And they have to somehow tra traverse, transverse this, uh, this ever-expanding uh, maze within their companion's head and trying to uh, explore it. And there's a safe place in there because you've got that, you know, you've got a part of the brain that you can kind of, you've cleared out and it seems relatively safe. Uh, we can rest there. That's kind of neat. Um, so those are examples. But what can you do with this space? What makes it interesting? What makes it interesting is the fact that now, because there is no town, per se, there is, everything is part of the dungeon. Everything is part of the adventure spot. So the players don't necessarily get downtime. And if you're running a kind of campaign where you want to emphasize this idea that anything can happen at any time, then this really works because there is no downtime. Uh, random encounters can happen at any time. You're, you're rolling. You're, even if everything else has gone perfectly all right, you're rolling anyway uh, while they're sleeping to see if someone tries to break into their house or into their camp and steal their stuff at night, at any given night. Um, or maybe someone is trying to break in to leave something for them, like a note. Uh, oh, an admirer is leaving a note, a creepy admirer that is breaking in to leave a note, and so therefore they're not the good kind of admirer. The good kind of admirer uh, would probably find a way to leave a note in... probably wouldn't even leave a note. They would just come up and talk to you. You're like, hey, I think you're cool. Dude, you want to get a burger? I think you're, yeah, let's do that. Cool, thanks. All right, bye. Um... Yes, I am that awkward. All right. So, there is no downtime. Adventure is on all the time. Another, another cool thing about this sort of arrangement is that your, your setup is more contained. You are not coming up with a country. Or a place, uh, you know, a, a grand scheme of things. You are coming up with a single, singular location to start with, and then you can expand upon that depending on where you want this dungeon or this uh, adventure location to go. Um, in a way, that can actually make the, the game master's job easier. It can make it a little bit harder if you're used to having such a wide tapestry to draw upon but i think it's a fun challenge to those for those people that are used to like i'm gonna make this big sweeping thing like no you're not this time i challenge you to make just a small place a small blip it's a blip upon your map it means nothing in the grand scheme of things but to those who are there it is everything and that is your challenge to make that and make it amazing without using anything from any of your other locations. Ooh, that's all. That would be hard for a lot of people. It would be hard for me. Um, and I'm thinking of it. So, when's a good time to do this? If you are interested in running a... I want to call it a West Marches Dungeon or a West Dungeon style. Mm, excuse me. Pardon me. Oh, goodness. I want to call it that because I was inspired by a long-running uh, game journal, I guess you can call it, that I read on Dragon's Foot. And I wish I could remember the name of it. I cannot for the life of me. I'm sure I could just look it up. But the I'm just, ton just talking right now. So, but... It was really cool, and what the 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 DM did for this is they cre they had a town, and the town existed right above the dungeon. All right, 
And so it was kind of like, kind of inspired a bit by, say, um, <sighs> that dungeon in Waterdeep, I think it is, where people go down the well in this tavern and they end up in this mad wizard's maze kind of thing. I forget the name of that one too. Um, I'm sure someone's going to shout it down in the comments. I, <laughs> I actually own the book. That's what makes this lack of memory embarrassing as all heck. I own the book. It's down there somewhere. Um, anyway, I just think Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and that's what they call it in the fifth edition, but I know it's got a better name somewhere. But that's not the point. So they're kind of, kind of inspired by that idea, the idea that there is a dungeon and that people get down there through a tavern uh, they have to pay a fine, or that they pay an entrance fee and an exit fee, and um, and then you go through, and you can adventure, and there's whole societies down there. There's whole uh, you, there. You know, there was uh, the DM had this whole goblin market concept that I thought was fantastic. It reminded me so much of uh, the the troll market from the the second Hellboy movie, and that was I'm sure that. I don't know which came first. I can't remember, obviously. But, I mean, this whole concept is a really cool concept that's been around for a long time. Um, so they probably were not even inspired by Hellboy. But I made that connection and I loved it. Um, and you can do things like that in a dungeon. And you can show how different communities can interact with each other, can trade, can have commerce, can have interactions they can fight wars between each other inside this dungeon you can make all that work it's it's i don't want to say it's easy but it's not as complex when you have one small location and the the factions that you're that you're looking at they're not huge factions they are factions that might be 20 or 30 creatures all gathered together to create a small community um if you want to see something like this in action then you can actually look at Keep on the Borderlands and the, the Caves of Chaos that are there. And you see how those different caves are set up, all the different creatures that live within each of the caves. And start thinking to yourself, well, what happens, you know, when these creatures interact with each other? What's going on with them when the when the player characters aren't invading their homes and trying to steal their stuff? And that just basically picture that, but then have one of the factions be the place that the player characters come from. So you never actually leave the caves of chaos. And that one of the you know take one of the caves, or you add a cave, and that cave is the cave of the this human bandit community, um, and that's where your your PCs come from. I mean that'd be an interesting idea. Expanding on, on that a little bit. So that's what that DM did. And I thought that was really cool. And I and I think that that would be not too difficult to do. But the main concept and reason why it's West March's style-ish is that the DM basically had all the West March's rules, which is uh, time passes in real time on days when you're not adventuring. So, uh, and, and I think their rule was uh, the party basically, they, they got to play for like two hours once a week if I recall correctly. And so they would get in, they would get as far as they could in the dungeon in that two hour time period, and then, but they'd have to leave enough time to get out again because if they failed to get out, bad things happened. Um, and whoever showed up, uh, whoever showed up that week, they're the ones who went adventuring. Um, if, if someone missed, then they missed. And that's okay. And I think that's what the, this person did. Although they may, they may they may not have done that, but I think that was, was what they were talking about. And that's certainly a West March's West March's piece of things is the idea of you got a dungeon, we're going to explore it. Whoever shows up shows up. Whoever doesn't, it's okay. You know, no big deal. Not gonna no no grand plots are being ruined. No one's going to be like, ah, oh, you know, you've missed so many times, so you're out of the game because you've messed it up for everyone. No, it's fine. It's West March's style dungeon crawl. Uh, you get in. Each each session is its own delve, and you get out by the end of the session, and you keep a map and figure, try to figure out, you know, the players can keep their own map and try to figure out 
what what places they've been to. The Dungeon Master, of course, has their map in the background there, and they can laugh when, you know, sometimes a player map is accurate and sometimes it's not. And um, that can get fun if the players have missed cool locations because they didn't see secret doors and you're just like, <laughs> or they didn't go down a corridor and they're like, oh, there's nothing down that corridor. We don't have to check that. And you're going, mm, okay. When you know that there's actually two doors down that corridor that were just out of sight that they just didn't get to. And someone, you know, did put a an end on the map without thinking about it because uh, they, you know, and you're like, well, you know, maybe you should revisit that at some point. And they're like, oh, well, no, we don't. It's fine. They're like, okay, cool. Yeah, you you just missed out on that cool treasure that I put down there, but sure. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I'm playing. It's Anyway, so that's one way to do it. You can do the same thing with a forest. Uh, players are starting off in an elven village, and now they're exploring the forest, exploring the forest paths, because a forest can be like a dungeon in the sense that there's paths that get through things. There's undergrowth that makes it impassable in, pl in places, and but you do get forest clearings. You do get animal tracks that are very, very thin and narrow. Um, and I, yes, you can climb a tree if you can get to the tree trunk. You can't always get to the tree trunks and a lot of like old growth, uh, very thick uh, forests. And sometimes you can't. Uh, here in where I live, there are lots of redwoods and the redwoods tend to not always be difficult to get to tree trunks and so you could technically, you know, climb them up. That's fine. Um, so those are other options. All right. When would you not want to do this? Well, if you didn't want to have your player characters stuck in one place for long periods of time, if you like high variety, and by high variety, I mean if you like being in the desert one game session, in the mountains another, and in the swamp the next, and uh, and you think that's the best way to do things. Probably a one location dungeon is not going to be your cup of tea. And that's okay, too, because there's, I mean, <laughs> there's beautiful stuff in the world for you, too. Um, let's see. So we talked about kind of what, what when you don't want to do it when you do want to do it, and what you can do with it. So those are important things we we need to know. What's another example of something fun that you can do with this sort of thing? Well, you can make the exploration interesting. Because you only have one dungeon to worry about, you get to be more detailed with that dungeon. And the restocking tables. You make yourself a little restocking table uh, for each level. So after they've initially explored the level, uh, that means that when they, have, when they go back through that level again, there's a chance that there's going to be new monsters there. New monsters and maybe a new treasure. And so they have something to strive against in order to just to get back to where they left off adventuring the first time. And that can, it can be frustrating if done, you know, too much, but it can also add a lot of spice to things. It can make the plays really feel lived in. Uh, and then you, uh, you put in like traps and puzzles, but what if those traps and puzzles kind of stay and they become part of the scenery in a sense, they were part of the flavor of the dungeon. Um, I think that's a, a cool idea you get a wishing well and the wishing well gives out you know good and or bad advice once a day someone tosses in a copper piece and they get you know an eight ball kind of answer um that could be something that you know people just kind of they go by and it, and you know it becomes like the local watering hole in a sense for the monsters maybe for the players as well maybe there's a a a truce amongst the orcs and the goblins and the troglodytes where they all agree that you know the wishing well is a place that they can uh, meet to draw water for their respective camps and also hold conference to discuss rights and wrongs and they're in the process of creating a fledgling government 
Do the PCs uh, join them in this effort and encourage this and try to maybe help them along? Or do the PCs be like, oh, wait, they're getting organized. Now they're going to threaten our faction if they actually start working together. So we have to stop this. Um, those are kind of cool questions that you can, your party can choose to answer. That's one of the beautiful things about this kind of play is because you can get more detailed on each of the individual locations, you can also allow your players a little more free reign within it in order to affect change. Um, your players may choose to, you know, help this help these creatures create their kind of government. Does that mean that the government's going to be appreciative? Maybe, maybe not. Um, is it going to form an army that the pieces can then ex exploit to help them explore further down in the dungeon? Probably not, because most governments are far more interested in containing or dealing with what they have. And if they, ha if they put together an army of exploration, it would not be on the PC's behalf, it would be on their own behalf, going in the direction that they feel is best, not what the PC's feel are best, even though the pieces are highly influential. Uh, history is full of conferences where highly influential people try to direct the destiny of nations uh, that should have kowtowed to them or bowed down to them and were told to pound sand uh, you know <laughs> probably both figuratively and in some cases quite literally um so that is something that you can you can use that in order to create interesting situations to allow your your players the ability to make this area their own without allowing them to turn every role-playing social encounter to their advantage to the point where they become unstoppable um, that's a, another important thing to keep in mind when you have one single singular location you don't want uh, them to at low levels become rulers of this place because you know yes we are in the pc's corner and a lot of times but if there's no challenge there's no game if there's no challenge then what are you playing for so don't let them use their wiles necessarily to overcome all of the challenges mm -hmm. And maybe you want to let them kind of lead this government in a sense or get involved in this government. Well, then that all that can do, if you keep the faction small, each faction is small. We're talking no more than 20 or 30, right? Well, so that gives them a little bit more power and influence in that local area. Sure, maybe that does, maybe they use that to create a safe town or safe haven for themselves and their friends that that um, is further down into the dungeon than it was than was their original home where they came from and that might be cool that might be a, a positive thing for them because keep in mind when you are rolling for your reaction tables especially if you're using an osr style game and you have those beautiful uh 2d6 uh, reaction tables that i quite enjoy there's always a chance that those orcs are going to react in a friendly fashion. There's always a chance that those uh, elves are going to be very unfriendly. There's always a chance that that hydra is going to be very friendly with you. So that there's no reason why the quote-unquote evil creatures can't form an alliance, at least temporarily, with the party to achieve some goal that they have within this dungeon. You can allow the dice to decide that. You can decide it yourself and just roll the clicky clacks for fun. Um, I generally don't recommend doing that all the time, but every once in a while it can add to the mystique, as it were. But it's good to use a lot of unexpected things don't allow this this is good not just for like a uh all in contained in one dungeon but for any game in general don't allow yourself to become predictable as a game master because that can also 
damage the fun. If people start realizing that, you know, well, you always set up your bosses in a certain fashion. There's always three stages to your bosses. There's always, you know, like after every boss, there's always a treasure behind the throne room or the, behind the throne. Um, you know, every treasure chest is going to have two magic items. There's all these things that can uh, make you, you predictable to your players. Random dice rolls, like reaction tables, wandering monster tables, stuff like that, that's what helps you not be predictable. Because you're using the resources of the game in order to trump your own uh, instincts. And while we, while we often have great instincts, especially those of us who've been doing this for a long time, we also get ruts. We get ruts where we, we get used to doing just one thing and one thing only because that's our favorite thing. And it's important sometimes to branch out as a, a game master and do something different. So if you always run high story things, you know, take the time. And even if you just do it as a solo game for yourself, run a dungeon crawl. But that is very low stakes, very low story, and just kill monsters and take their stuff. Get out of your 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 head space for a bit and kind of smell some of the, the flowers on the other side. See what happens. Could be fun. And it could just, you know, reinforce what you already feel about your play style. Now we're getting to the meandering part. So I think I'm going to wrap this up. So, do you need a town, a dungeon, and a wilderness? No. You need a location, and that location can be all three. It can be your town and your dungeon and your way to get to that dungeon because it's all contained in one space. And that's a cool way to play. I've seen it work really well. And, oh, another another place where this is done is the well. Although, no, actually that's not true because they have a town and then above the town and that is where the dungeon is. Uh, so that is not an example. I apologize. But, um, but yeah, you, I mean, it would not be too difficult to set this sort of thing up. You could actually just uh, procedurally generate a single layer of a, of a dungeon, plant your players in the middle of it, and see what they do. See what communities they build. And having them without a support structure could actually uh, help them stretch their abilities. Because now there's no safety net. It's all on them. And that might be fun for some people. Your cleric doesn't have a church to go to to get more spells. They are the church in this location. They might have people come to them and be like, oh my gosh, you worship that god? Well, I, I worship that god too. And they're like, well, great, do you know any spells? Like, no, I don't, but I just really need your guidance. Um, you know, there's all there's ways to build communities in in a the world is the dungeon kind of environment. I think uh, Tunnels and Trolls does this really well. The world The world is the dungeon. I'm pretty sure they have a, a few uh, modules for tunnels and trolls that are basically that. Um, it's a lot of there's it's it's been done before. This is not new. No, I'm not trying to say it is. I just think it's a neat idea, and I don't often see it too well. I think uh, the Iron Realm is a podcast that does this. Um, there's a few other places that probably do something similar. I don't. I, Iron Realm was the only one that jumps to my mind. Tale of the Manticore is a great uh, game to listen to, but it's not in the in that style. Um, so yeah, th these are things to think about. Okay, if you enjoyed this video and this ramble, then please leave a like and a subscribe, maybe a comment down below. I'd appreciate it. And um, thank you for joining me. Peace be with you. Bye-bye.